Welcome to the Performance Enhancing Podcast. It's like steroids for your brain. A podcast for people that want the best info, but just don't have the time. Get your podcast fix with the Cliff Notes versions of your favorite podcasts. No fluff, just the actionable golden nuggets. Having this much knowledge at your fingertips should be downright illegal. So get ready for another dose of Performance Enhancing Podcast with Satori Prime. Here's your host, Elon Ferdman. Hello, hello. Welcome to another Performance Enhancing Podcast episode with your host, myself, Elon Ferdman. So we ended part one with the greatest gift you can give to a person. And it's something that we've really focused our business around. So if you haven't seen part one, make sure you go back and listen to that first, as the rest of this podcast will probably be a little bit out of context for you. Now, in this podcast, we cover a lot of things. Just some of the things we'll be covered are how to unlock you and shift the world around you, how to be courageous, our biggest advantage over our competitions and how you can steal it. And I think what will probably leave the most of you with your mouth agape is the concept of letting fear be your guide versus the thing that you run away from. So enjoy this performance enhancing podcast. This is part two of our Beer Talk 3.0. I look forward to seeing you on future podcasts. Have an amazing day, everyone. Yeah. I mean, when when you do something like that, you you use one of the most beautiful things that a human can use, which is vulnerability. Uh, it's basically a complete let go. You completely let your freak flag fly and you're like, this is who I am. Like me, don't like me, love me, don't love me, accept me, don't accept me. This is me. Yeah, don't matter. And you know what? I think it's always important to keep digging and keep being better than you were the day before. I'm all for that. But with that has to come love and self-acceptance because most people look for an out, like an external thing. Like I need acceptance from this. I need agreement from them. I need approval from mommy and daddy. I need blah, 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 blah. When in fact, the only thing you actually need is your own self-acceptance. And when that happens, all that other stuff comes to be. I'll never forget, I, you know, I have, we have Russian immigrant parents. I was going to go to be an attorney, um, took the LSATs, had applications sent out, et cetera. Went and did the landmark forum. Uh, I think it's funny that, that my brother and my dad had done it before. And they were like, you're going to make a life altering choice uh, when you take the forum. And I thought they were talking about me breaking up with my girlfriend. And I was like, if I fucking break up with my girlfriend because of this course, I'm going to be so mad and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to kill them and all this stuff. <laughs> And so I come home. Yeah, I come home and I'm like, I sit my parents down, right? And like Russian Jewish parents whose son has wanted to be an attorney since the age he was 12. <laughs> and I'm about to tell him that I'm not going to law school anymore. And I'm thinking to myself, like, this is going to be an all out war in my house. And I say, listen, I looked at my life. And I realized that I'm living other people's wish for me. I'm not living my own life. I'm actually living a, into a world that others have kind of not dragged me, but like I heard so many people be like, oh, you'd be an amazing attorney. You'd be an amazing attorney, blah, blah, blah. And I, I, I bought into it, right? And obviously like being an attorney is quote unquote a good job. And I realized that I was doing it for others, not for me. And it was the first time, first time ever at 21 years old in my entire life that I woke to the thought that I don't have to do things for others. I just have to do them for me. So I tell my parents this in one line. I kind of tell them like this, this little thing. And both of them just look at me and go, okay. And in my head, I thought that I'm literally walking into like a war and they're like, okay. And what I realized was because I was so grounded in what it was that I wanted, yeah. there was no room for argument. It wasn't like, you know, most parents, and I'm, I'm a parent of two young kids, so I, I haven't gotten to this stage yet, but most parents, what are they concerned with? Their kids' well-being, right? That their kids are safe, that their kids are 
well taken care of, etc. And most of the time when you're a child and even into young adulthood, your parents still treat you like a baby. Why? Because they're still concerned for you all the time. But when you come from a place of just complete and utter understanding of who you are, and you make a statement, a very simple statement, you know, me saying, I'm not going to law school. I could have said that a year ago and it would have been a war, but I was so grounded and people sense that. So again, you know, I, I agree with guys so much, like when you finally get rid of all the fucking shit in the way of who you truly are and you just be you. The life that you want, the dream life, the thing that you've been dreaming about all this time is there. I'm not saying it's easy to get there. I'm just saying like, that's what your focus needs to be. Not about doing more, working harder, figuring this out or that out. It is literally unlocking you. It's almost like, you know, when you do that, you just burst, burst, literally burst. And then you let so much light and energy in and that obviously gets portrayed to everyone around you. They're impacted by it. And it's just like a magnet for goodness. And, and I think, and I think, you know, doing that around people makes something possible for other people that they didn't know was possible for them. Cause you know, people are limited by what they believe and also by what they see. Cause if you're willing to believe something, you usually see it. But a lot of times people need to see in order to believe something, just watching somebody do something like that. Uh, usually sparks something in people. And it's funny you brought that up. And the first memory that popped into my head was starting this business. Because every other job I had gotten after college outside of working with you at the bank, like all the jobs after that, when I was like, didn't really know what I wanted to do for like about, you know, I don't know, six months there or whatever. Every job I went to go get, mom and dad were like, not having it. Like, this is not what you're going to do. This is not for you. This is not, you know, like it was just all at war. And of course you get so attached to everything. So it's like, you know, it becomes this like horrible back and forth. And I remember when I decided to get into online, into the online industry, I didn't even know I was getting into the online industry. I didn't even know what the online industry was. I found a page. I was looking for something. It seemed kind of related to it. And I was like, I didn't know where else to get started. So I just went for it. But I remember a few months in and I was doing it and my shock that entire time was that mom and dad hadn't come to me one time, not once, to show their displeasure, to tell me that not to do it, to tell me that I was investing my money stupidly. And I know a lot of people have these businesses and they get started and friends and family look at them like they're insane. I had an insane belief in what I was doing. And I don't know why, based on nothing, based on no evidence, based on no results, based on nothing. Everything in the world was that this is bullshit and a scam if you looked online, right? What I was doing. But for whatever reason, for me, it aligned perfectly with my skill set, with what I wanted to do, with who I wanted to be for other people, with how I wanted to serve people. It was like I could just clearly see that if I could master this, this thing that was inside of me is going to go on the world right and i just knew it i was like if not this then what else and, I, and i've told this story before but like i purposely consciously put myself in mass amounts of debt when i started my business because i said to myself there's nothing else i could go do there's no job i could go take that would start me because i would have to start again at the bottom of the ladder like i you know lost basically all the momentum i had that would ever get me out of the debt that I just put myself in. The only solution was to make it, make it big, and just have money be no longer an issue in my life, where I could super concentrate only on the things that would truly matter to me. And for me, it was like that context, I, I couldn't, I just, I remember I could not believe that mom and dad didn't have anything to say about it. They were like the exact opposite. They were so supportive, it was insane to me. I was like, this is just insane. And, and I was like, and I, I felt exactly like Elon. It was, I was so grounded. I so strongly believed and had faith. It was just so apparent to everybody else. And there's been a few times in my life where I could look at other things that that happened. Like Landmark was one of those things for me. Um, you know, that's why so many people I think went to go do it around me is because they saw that faith I had and that belief in, in what I had done. Uh, but I can think of literally maybe like two or three moments in my entire life where I had a vehicle or a context for life that way. And I think that is critical, 
critical. I mean, depending on what your goals are, right? If you're like, look, I just want to make six figures this year. I don't know if you need to put your, push yourself to that level, but if you're like, I want to make a global impact, I want to make a, you know multiple millions of dollars this year. Yeah, there's some there's some groundwork you got to do um, to get there. Yeah, I just want to say that as Guy's older brother, for a very very long time, I was always kind of the the lead, and Guy kind of followed into things, right? And I just want to give you like a personal impact, right? So Guy had that shift, the story that he just shared with you. Now, I had brought him into previous jobs, previous hobbies, previous everything. We'd both been out of this work. I was trying to build a medical consulting business. Guy's off doing this online marketing thing. And I saw a massive shift in him. Guy had no results when he approached me with this business, nothing. What he had done is he actually helped me build a website, which was actually helping me get some results. And I kind of fell in love with marketing. But really, when I approached me and was like, look, would you consider joining me in this business? Part of me is like, what fucking business? <laughs> like, you have no business. Um, but I'd never seen him work so hard at anything before in my life, ever. And I knew, knew, just like he knew, that putting that much work, that much effort, that much faith in something was going to produce ridiculous results. Part of me, not knowing anything, I was like, you know what? If nothing else, to go on this ride with him, I have a feeling this is going to be a really interesting ride. Yeah. And it was a big reason why I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I hate what I'm doing right now anyway. Like, I think he's going places. And it was the first time I, I think ever that you really just took the reins and you let us. And I remember we had a conversation one time and I was like, you're like, if I have to carry you on my back, we are going to make it. <laughs> yeah. And I've never been like that about anything. Elon's dead on. Like, I always kind of lived in the shadow. We had a lot of conversations at Landmark too when we were in coaching together about like, you know, dealing with that kind of stuff, stepping out of that shadow. It took me a really long time to even understand what that truly meant. I always felt a little bit held back. Um, Elon would cast a really big shadow. He was like one of those, you know, A plus students and um, every, like things just seemed to come easier, e at least from my context, easy to him. I don't know like how much work he put in. Obviously I wasn't there. Um, but suddenly like something hit and it was, and it wasn't just me, you know, when I brought Elon in, he allowed, he allowed it. You know, he was, for the first time, he allowed me to lead, um, which was great because it empowered me. It also had me get a little bit on, give me another edge because suddenly another person was relying on me. Also, Elon was a complete psychopath for ever joining me in the first place because of just the circumstances sure. he had in his, because of the circumstances he had in his life. You know, he, he basically said, I'm going to start a business with you when he's dealing with home foreclosures, a new baby on the way. IRS on his ass and it's like suddenly you need to work like <laughs> to build a business and for anybody who's ever done that before you, the amount of effort that that takes you understand what that what I, why what I just said is so major um, even these three years you know all the things we've had to deal with money being stolen from us um, you know getting scammed here a lot a lot of very expensive lessons a lot of things when when most people would be like way beyond my ability to have a threshold of pain over here I mean, you know, a round of applause for Elon for everything he's had to deal with as a, as a husband and as a father of now two kids uh, through this entire process. But I don't think that we ever – it's amazing because you really bought into my vision that there was a light at the end of the tunnel as long as we just kept freaking walking forward no matter what happened. And most people don't, don't have that capacity. It gets dark really quick on them. Um, so again, you know, like big ups to you for sticking with me. Cause there have been a lot of times you can be like, sorry, man, I can't do this anymore. And I have to go do something else. And we've had a few situations that have come up that I could have taken Elon away from the business and had him put back in a traditional space. And even then he so bought into the vision that the resilience around it, right. Remember that? Like some opportunities that came up, um, he still was like, I still prefer to be here no matter what they offer over there. And I had to like literally talk him into like, no, no, if they give you an opportunity, like you have to go for it. Like you have to go for it. I'm like, I don't care if you put in an hour a day on the business, as long as I know you're present, like I'll make it happen anyway. So I just, I just want to acknowledge at this point, my incredible 
amazing supportive wife fanny i don't think that any woman sane would rationally allow me to do what i did for as long as i did Guys, what you have to understand is that for the first, I would almost say, guy, what, 16 to 18 months, we didn't pull a penny out of the business? Not one. Right? Um, like, okay, so my house is being foreclosed on, okay? My wife is an attorney, so obviously she had like a pretty decent income. We're starting to blow through her savings because I'm, you know, at first I was like living on welfare checks and then that died. And now we have another kid on the way. I'm not bringing money in. She's the one carrying the family. And she still sees us. And now keep in mind, she has no fucking clue what this business is. And no matter how much we try to explain it, she still doesn't understand it. Yeah. What she understands is money's going out. Money's not coming in. <laughs> and she still let me do this. And so like to you, Fanny, if you ever listen to this, Without you, I know I wouldn't be here. And the fact that I'm celebrating three years now with Satori Prime is like, I don't know. It, it's absolutely beyond belief. And um, if you're a wife or a partner or whatever out there of someone that's going through this process, I want you to know that the best thing that you can provide them is your support and your love and your belief. And, I, and I've said this to my wife, like the biggest shifts in our business have been when she believed that I can actually make this happen. Like we sat, I think it was May, beginning of May, right, bro? Yeah. And um, we sat and I kind of like showed her our finances and all this stuff. And she's like, okay, here's what we need, X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. That created a game with Guy and I. That month we blew it out of the water. And I looked at her and I was like, are you kidding me? Literally within a week, we accomplished the goals that you set out for three months because you actually support me and like behind me 100%. Not that she wasn't before, but you know what I mean. So just to get to the life that you want, you have to be willing to do things that other people aren't willing to do. And that means that your family and your support system has to buy into that. Now, I don't mean to go and hard sell them. That's a horrible approach. But if your actions and your belief are the things that speak to them, like I didn't have to convince my wife. She saw the amount of work and effort that Guy and I were putting in, and that was infectious. And she knew that to live the life that we had dreamed of living, it's gonna take that thing. Like I've told her now, I love our business and, you know, I'm obsessed with our business and we're obviously very, you know, financially fine. But I told her by 35, I want to be at a point where I'm working four hour days, you know? And so if that means for the next two years, I will literally sprint my ass off and put in 14 hour days every single day, I will because that's my end result. So whatever it is that you freaking have to do, to create that space to make that happen, go out and do it. Yep. It is so freaking worth it. Sprint, sprint for two years, three years, five years. Most of you have had shitty jobs for 12, 15, 20 years. That job could disappear tomorrow because of a company downsize or some fucking redundant bullshit in the UK or whatever the hell they call it. Follow your heart, follow your passion, and work your fucking ass off to get it. And I promise you, the results are amazing. So, Period. with that whole with that whole rant, cheers first of all. Cheers, man. Love the, pa love the passion. Love the passion. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 mean, I don't know. If I want to. I want to. I, I want to ask you something. We spoke about this in an earlier podcast with uh, with Ryan and. And he, he literally, guy said this and he's like, you just blew my mind. And I don't know if we share this with others. We may have, but whatever. I think it's just really brilliant. So we talked about letting go and right. Just having, uh, accepting what is and just being committed, not attached. 
The other thing we spoke about is fear. So we have a really interesting view of fear. Um, so why don't you share that with people? Because I think that insight alone can actually help people break through so many walls in their lives. Yeah. Uh, and this is something its crazy that we got this as early on as we got it. I look at it now and I say how fortunate we were. I mean, this came out of a uh, program that Elon and I took. I was 21. You were 23, right? Wisdom course, I believe. Yeah. And uh, to even register for that course, I mean, I was a college student. I was broke. Elon had a uh, 1995 Mark III golf <laughs> I could it could be a Volkswagen golf um and we sold the car or Elon convinced mom and dad to sell the car something sold that freaking car just to pay for the deposit to go take this very expensive program this a 10 month long program and the only thing that got me was he said that week three we will deal with your failure conversation you will never look at failure the same way again and I knew at that point in my life I was paralyzed by everything I was afraid of if I was afraid wasn't going to do it the girl was across the room, wasn't going to walk there. If it was a job, I remember getting on like phone interviews and making a mockery out of myself because of the fear of actually getting the job and I would have to perform and all this kind of stuff. Like I had no faith in who I was whatsoever. And, and, and you're talking less than 10 years ago. That's who I was. So, you know, for those of you guys who know me today and you're like, how did this happen? I'm telling you right now, like I am all training. I'm a, I'm like an athlete that just trained for a really long period of time. <laughs> it just happened to be my mind. And I happened to like, just, trip over a wire and when my face planted it face it fell into a really good place I don't, I don't know i really don't know how all this happened like it's just kismet as far as i'm concerned i i i feel like destiny led me here most of the time um but going back to the fear conversation so most people right like if you look at if you think about the conversation in your mind one of the things you're going to want to consider is perhaps that the mind is just a mechanism of the body so if you believe in mind, body, soul, which I, I think everyone, at least at some level, believes in the soul, who you really are, you could say is the soul. And then there's this mechanism, right, called the body and the mind. So it's distinct from who you are, but it's feeding you information at the same time. Like you get burned, there's feedback, right? Your brain is processing information, there's feedback, and it's feeding you feedback. So the thoughts that you're listening to in your brain, in your mind, are not yours. That's not you. That's a feedback mechanism trying to give you information about your surroundings all the time. And its function is to keep you alive. Your body's function is to keep you alive and resuscitated. Your mind's body, your mind's function is to keep the body keep going, right? So it's a survival mechanism. I'm not saying it's the only thing it does, but it's a survival mechanism at its base work, core work. So it's great, again, when the car is you know, about to slam you in the face and you need to jump out of the way, or the stove is too hot and you gotta lift your hand off of it because that's part of survival. But when the girl is across the room, when you really, really want to do that thing and you don't, and then that chatter comes up, that chatter that's really familiar to you, it's done It's done it a million times before, and you don't take action, it's doing the same thing. It's trying to have you survive something that is not even putting your life at risk. Because whether a fear is imagined or real, to you, it's real. It seems real. So what I could tell you is I want you to look at moments in your life where you've been afraid, but you've taken action anyway. And you could say that courage is not the absence of fear. It's the ability to act in the face of it, right? So mm -hmm. for those of you who have been courageous when you've been afraid, how have you felt at the end of it, right? Wasn't it almost a magical experience, uh, empowering experience, an enlightening experience? You felt different. You were suddenly somehow changed by the experience. For some of you guys, it's been skydiving. For some of you, it was walking across the room to ask that girl out. It doesn't matter what it was for you. It's just, that's all that's all relativity, right? It doesn't matter though. So when we coach people, people ask me, well, how do I get happy? How do I live a life that's magical, That's that I feel great about myself, that I feel like I'm accomplishing stuff? And it's like, well, what do you feel like when you accomplish stuff that you're afraid of? Don't you experience all those things that we all want to experience all the time? So Elon and I figured that out at a pretty young age, and we realized, damn, we've had it wrong this whole time. All this time, here's fear, and we've been going, boop. But here's fear, and we decided that instead of being afraid of it and running this way, we're going to go this way towards it. In fact, we're going to chase it. So if it moves, we're going to chase after it and keep running after it, right? So here's fear now, and instead of running away, we actually redistinguish it as it's the universe telling us what's next. This is our guide. I have a fear guide. We look at animals all around the planet, you know, uh, baby sea turtles who are born and run right into the ocean, whales who haven't been back to their birthing ground in 10, 15 years and suddenly just make their way back exactly where they were with no GPS, right? 
how do they all do that? They're running on some kind of instinct. Some We call it like the magnetism of the planet that they're following. But it's the same thing. What if the magnetism of the planet is fear? And all we've mm -hmm. done is fucked up the distinction and said, that's a scary thing, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Right? And suddenly this beauty of humanity is on the other side of what you're afraid of. So my invitation to you is, is that the thing that you're afraid of the most is the thing you take action on first. It is literally how you can create your schedule. And that's what Elon and I look at. We're like, what are we afraid in business right now? What are we afraid of in relationships right now? And then the first thing we look at is how do we go and do that? And when we do that, that's where that, that juice comes from that you guys see a lot is because we're in that state a lot. We've gotten so comfortable with being uncomfortable that we no longer realize that we're uncomfortable. Um, and that's really what, it, right? Isn't that the, it doesn't case, I don't even feel uncomfortable anymore, but yeah. it's like, I know there's uncomfortability all the time. I just don't even think of it that way. I go, oh, here's this thing now. And then we deal with it. And here's this thing now. And then we deal with it, but it's always with power because I've built up a muscle so much that when I do that, I have so much faith that I'll get to the other side that I'm not stopped by being when I'm on the other, when I'm on before I've gotten to that side. And it's taken years to develop that pattern, years to develop that fucking pattern but when you get it good damn it's worth yeah. the entire ride. yeah monks for years and i just listened to a ted talk of one monks for drunk, years <laughs> what again so, ah, you're drunk <laughs> <laughs> monks for years 12 percent or baby monks for years work work on a sorry mind training Everything in life is temporal, right? So people are so afraid of fear and so afraid to go after those things because th there's there's a pain associated with it. There's a body sensation associated. There's a paralyzation associated with it. For monks, they're like on a completely different end of the spectrum. They've actually put these guys in fMRI machines to test to see their brain, and they'll sound a sound like a bomb just went off. Their body won't even flinch. Like wow. the most basic human knee-jerk reaction is like protect myself their body won't flinch why because they know that everything is fleeting they the, the analogy used i thought was so beautiful is like if you can have everything that worries you and enlivens you be like a bird flying through the sky is the analogy of how that thought should come across your your mind then you know you've gotten to a great place and so the reason I think we've gotten so good at being uncomfortable with being uncomfortable, because we just know it's going to lead to the next thing. It's just like such a fluid thing. It's like, we'll just deal with this as a passing thing to get to where we know we got to get to. Again, it all goes back, I think, to the mission, to the... 2020 goal to the making a difference for other people to the not giving a shit about money but actually being about making a difference a huge global impact in this world all of this minutia you know like when i'm sick jameson actually wrote something like this today he said you know i'm sick i feel crappy still came to work still busted my ass still closed deals etc why his game is bigger than himself yeah we have thousands of entrepreneurs around the world that count on us. We, we run probably four or five masterminds a week, okay? If Guy or I have a sore throat or feel shitty or whatever the hell it is, there's no option to not show up. People count on us. You know, my podcast that comes out on Mondays and Thursdays, people count on that showing up Monday and Thursday. If I wake up Sunday and I'm like, I don't feel like launching this podcast, that's not an option. Create a context in your life, create a playground in your life where there is no opening for your feeling to dictate how you live your life. Yeah, I want to interject over here, right? Because uh, we, we talked about this earlier today too, and I want to bring it up again. I think it's so critical with what you just said is that most people are trying to solve their problems. They want to get rid of all their problems. Guys, if you solved all your problems, you're going to be so fucking bored, you're going to want to be in the casket. <laughs> Stop trying to solve all your fucking problems. You're not going to have a life worth living. What you really want to seek is stop trying to solve the problems. Just create one big problem that's big enough for you to live for. That you could spend your entire life 
trying to figure out how to solve that problem. World hunger, transformation of the planet, sustainability. These are problems worth your life. Communication, connection, healthy relationships, right? All these things that the things that when we look at other people and they're doing them, you watch these YouTube videos and you're so inspired. Why are you inspired? Because you see a problem that you connect with that's so big, you think to yourself, I would love to be part of that. Yeah. Even if there's no solution, you have no idea what that would look like. That's a problem worth your life. That's what actually marketing allows you to access is to communicate to people, right? If you look at marketing, it's just a communication device. Sure, people use it to make money because money is important in this game that we're playing right now. But it might not be down the road. But communication tools will always exist. You know when they when they launch apps, do you know the two major apps that sell in every store? It's got like 85% market share. Number one is games because everyone likes playing games. Business is a game too. Making money is a game too. We're all we all love games. From the moment you're a child, what do you want to do? Play, right? When you get an adult, the game just become way too fucking serious. Number two is <laughs> Number two is communication devices, Voxer, Snapchat, WhatsApp, all these things, Instagram, these are all communication devices. Why is it that they're the ones that get bought out for billions of dollars? All humans care about is connection and connection, <laughs> like connection and communication, sorry. That's all we care about. Yeah, we care just connecting and really fucking connecting. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, so like. <laughs> Welcome to the Performance Enhancing Podcast. It's like steroids for your brain. A podcast for people that want the best info, but just don't have the time. Get your podcast fix with the Cliff Notes versions of your favorite podcasts. No fluff, just the actionable golden nuggets. Having this much knowledge at your fingertips should be downright illegal. So get ready for another dose of performance enhancing podcast with Satori Prime. Here's your host, Elon Ferdman. Hello, hello. Welcome to another performance enhancing podcast episode with your host, Myself, Elon Ferdman. So, we ended part one with the greatest gift you can give to a person. And it's something that we've really focused our business around. So if you haven't seen part one, make sure you go back and listen to that first, as the rest of this podcast will probably be a little bit out of context for you. Now, in this podcast, we cover a lot of things. Just some of the things we'll be covered are how to unlock you and shift the world around you how to be courageous, our biggest advantage over our competitions and how you can steal it. And I think what will probably leave the most of you with your mouth agape is the concept of letting fear be your guide versus the thing that you run away from. So enjoy this performance enhancing podcast. This is part two of our Beer Talk 3.0. I look forward to seeing you on future podcasts. Have an amazing day, everyone. Yeah. I mean, when, when you do something like that, you, you use one of the most beautiful things that a human can use, which is vulnerability. Uh, it's basically a complete let go. You completely let your freak flag fly and you're like, this is who I am. Like me, don't like me, love me, don't love me, accept me, don't accept me. This is me. Yeah. Don't matter. And you know what? I think it's always important to keep digging and keep being better than you were the day before. I'm all for that. But with that has to come love and self-acceptance because most people look for an out, like an external thing. Like I need acceptance from this. I need agreement from them. I need approval from mommy and daddy. I need blah, 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 blah. When in fact, the only thing you actually need is your own self-acceptance. And when that happens, all that other stuff comes to be. I'll never forget, I, you know, I have, we have Russian immigrant parents. I was going to go to be an attorney, um, took the LSATs, had applications sent out, et cetera. Went and did the landmark forum. Uh, I think it's funny that, that my brother and my dad had done it before. And they were like, you're going to make a life altering choice. Uh, when you take the forum and I thought they were talking about me breaking up with my girlfriend and I was like if I fucking break up with my girlfriend because of this course I'm gonna be so mad and blah blah blah. I'm gonna kill them and all this stuff. <laughs> and so I come home Yeah, I come home and I'm like I sit my parents down right and like Russian Jewish parents 
whose son has wanted to be an attorney since the age he was 12. <laughs> and I'm about to tell him that I'm not going to law school anymore. And I'm thinking to myself, like, this is going to be an all out war in my house. And I say, listen, I looked at my life and I realized that I'm living other people's wish for me. I'm not living my own life. I'm actually living a, into a world that others have kind of not dragged me, but like I heard so many people be like, oh, you'd be an amazing attorney. You'd be an amazing attorney, blah, blah, blah. And I, I, I bought into it. Right. And obviously like being an attorney is quote unquote a good job. And I realized that I was doing it for others, not for me. And it was the first time, first time ever at 21 years old in my entire life that I woke to the thought that I don't have to do things for others. I just have to do them for me. So I tell my parents this in one line. I kind of tell them like this, this little thing. And both of them just look at me and go, okay. And in my head, I thought that I'm literally walking into like a war and they're like, okay. And what I realized was because I was so grounded in what it was that I wanted, yeah. there was no room for argument. It wasn't like, you know, most parents, and I'm, I'm a parent of two young kids, so I, I haven't gotten to this stage yet, but most parents, what are they concerned with? Their kids' well-being, right? That their kids are safe, that their kids are well taken care of, et cetera. And most of the time when you're a child and even into young adulthood, your parents still treat you like a baby. Why? Because they're still concerned for you all the time. But when you come from a place of just complete and utter understanding of who you are and you make a statement, a very simple statement, you know, me saying I'm not going to law school, I could have said that a year ago and it would have been a war, but I was so grounded 